Okay. Um, I hope everyone's suitably refreshed. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Chris. Um, I'm from England. I work for a company called Bead Gaming. Uh, we basically make casino websites, um, and our CMS of choice is Orchard. Um, I'm actually here to not talk about that. I'm here to talk about a product called Glimpse. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Glimpse. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's, it's a pretty good tool to be using. You probably should be using it. Um, so I'm going to start with a kind of introduction of what we do and then why we kind of started to look at Glimpse, why we had a use for using Glimpse, and then I'll show you um, what we've done with it and hopefully the future. Um, so, like I said, I work for a company called Bead Gaming. We make casino sites uh, very similar to One Stop. So what we do is we have a single solution and we just theme for every casino site that we get. So we've got quite a few brands. Um, you can see they're all very similar in layout, theme-wise. Um, there's quite a difference there. Um, so those brands that have just flashed up on the stage... Um, they're relatively small. Um, in January this year, we signed a contract with a huge client. Um, for those of you from the UK, you probably recognize them. Um, there's also a brand from Spain that we'll be launching next year, and the amount of traffic that we're getting meant that we had to put a huge focus on performance, um, which led us down this track of glimpse. So the sites are um, Grosvenor Casino, um, Mecca Bingo, and the Spanish one is Enracha. Um, who don't currently have a web presence, I'm told. Um, we will be launching their online um, gaming platform from scratch. So, what is Glimpse? Um, anyone who's done any front-end development will probably recognize this screen we've got here. So, if you have a front-end performance issue, or if you have a front-end bug, you can right-click, inspect element, you can look at the console, and you get quite powerful debugging tools right there and then on the screen, which kind of sucks, right? Because back-end people, why should we miss out? Well, thankfully, Glimpse, um, it's kind of like Firebug or Chrome DevTools for the server side. Um, it's open source, it's got an active community, it's extensible, and there's a healthy gallery of extensions, um, including extensions for Log4Net, AutoMapper, Azure Storage, and AutoFAC. Um, if that sounds familiar, it sounds a lot like Orchard. It's a very, very good fit for Orchard. So what does it look like in Orchard? Well, it's, in its essence, a, a NuGet package you can just install. Unfortunately, it doesn't work straight out the box with Orchard. You have to tinker with the web config file, um, but it's not hard to do. Um, so I'm going to come to my first live demo. Fingers crossed it works. If it's too small to read, just shout out and I'll switch to a different zoomed in version. Um, okay, so you can see on the bottom here, is that, is that visible to everyone or should I zoom in? Zoom, okay. Okay. Um, is that okay? Yep. Okay, so um, this is an out-of-the-box installation of Glimpse on what's very close to an out-of-the-box installation of Orchard. Um, you get what they call a head-up display at the bottom, um, and this gives you a summary of your request. It tells you how long it's spent in the server, how long was spent uh, rendering the DOM, it also gives you a bit of information about which controllers were used and which action filters were used. Um, not that useful with Orchard because 99% of the time the controller is item.display and the action filters are all the same. Um, so we kind of need to do a bit of work to get it to, to work with Orchard. Um, but it doesn't stop there. You can go in and see much more information about what happened in this request. Um, so you can expand this uh, head-up display and then you get what they call the tablet view. Uh, I'll just make this a bit bigger. So the first thing you'll notice is you get a, quite a nice timeline. And what we've got here is um, the out-of-the-box instrumented um, 
services, you've got blue for your action filters. Um, that big blue one there is probably the widget filter. Um, you've got yellow, which is your controllers. And you've got green, which is your views. Um, we can also flip through the tabs here and just have a look at some of the information. So you've got information about um, your HTTP cache um, configuration. So this is how your web.config looks, which is insanely useful when you come to debug. If you think you might have an incorrect connection string, um, you, you no longer have to remote on the box. You can just open up Glimpse, and off you go, you can have a look. Uh, you've also got some information about the environment. Um, that's my name on my laptop. Um, execution. So this is which um, filters executed. Um, you can obviously see the pipeline that Orchard goes through, including the widget filter somewhere. Can anyone see it? No, maybe it's filler down. Um, but what we'll see is a, quite a long time elapsed for that. Oh, there we go. Widget filter on result executing, and that's just over a second on that individual request. Um, now I'm going to come clean. I've altered the code base to make it a bit slower for the purposes of this demo. Um, <laughs> but there are some other issues as well that Glimpse will raise that I swear I haven't planted. They were there when I got there. Um, we also have a few other tabs. Metadata, not that useful um, in Orchard because of the dynamic views and dynamic shapes. Model binding is similar. Uh, the request tab tells us um, information about the request, what the, what the server received from the browser. The routes tab would tell us um, which routes were registered. It, again, it's not that useful with Orchard because of the um, alias implementation. Um, the SQL tab out of the box with Orchard doesn't work. Um, and that's what you get out of the box. So. When we installed this out of the box, we instantly saw huge blue bars in our filters. So we knew our widget filter was taking too long to execute. Um, but we wanted to know why. So what we had to do is we extended it. I'll just switch back. OK. So what I'm going to do now is um, go through and build a, a tab for Glimpse. So what we're going to do is we're going to instrument iCache service. And I'm going to show you just how easy it is to extend Glimpse and how we can build on top of what's already in Orchard um, to, get a, to get a much better idea of what's happening in our apps. So um, the first thing that we need in Glimpse is we need a tab. Yeah. We need somewhere where the data that we generate is going to go. And this is really easy to do. You can actually do this um, with just the get data method and the name property. Um, the other two properties, um, key and keys heading, just present the data slightly nicer. So all we're saying here is I want a tab. The tab is called cache service. And for the time being, what we're saying is, when you want the data for this tab, we'll just return null, because we don't have any data to show at the moment. Um, so what does that look like? Um, it looks like this. Oops. So we can see we now have a cache service tab. Um, unfortunately, it's empty, but we expected that because we just said the data was null. So the next thing we need is some data. And this is where it starts to get interesting. Uh, OK, so um, a lot of the data in Glimpse um, comes from what they call messages and the message broker. Doesn't necessarily have to come from there. Um, the configuration tab that we saw that read the web config won't come from a message broker. The implementation of the get data method there will just read the web config. But for the purposes of this demo, we're going to demonstrate the message broker in Glimpse. 
So the first thing that you need when you publish a message to a message broker is a message. So this is a model that represents the kind of data that we want to see in our tab. So we'll see um, we've got a message based abstract class does nothing more than puts an ID on the message. Um, we've also got this ID duration message um, interface, and that allows us to publish this message to the timeline. So not only are we going to see in our cache service tab a list of all the cache calls that we get, whether they were hits, misses, the puts, the clears, we're also going to see how long they took, and we'll see them appear in the timeline, which is pretty cool. Um, so if we go back to the tab that we had before, this is the tab that we created earlier, and we're going to very easily uh, set this up to um, be able to read the messages from the broker. And we can do that by flushing out the get data method and also adding one more method in there. So the items in the bold um, are the changes from the previous slide. You'll see in the get data method, um, we are getting the messages of typed cache message, and we're just returning them. And that's all you need to do. You'll also notice a, an extra method on here called setup. Um, this basically tells Glimpse that um, I am going to be publishing cache messages, so you should probably listen for them. Um, in order to do that, you also have to have your cache tab um, implement I tab setup. So Glimpse is very composable. You'll notice that this class um, inherits from an abstract class and also implements three interfaces. Um, every kind of um, configuration that you want your tab to have, every behavior you want it to have, all you've got to do is add an interface to your class and implement it. In most cases, it's just a, a single method. Like we see here, we've got I tab set up, um, and we're telling it um, to just persist the cache messages. Um, so that's all well and good, but um, we still haven't yet published the messages to the Glimpse broker. Um, so how do we do that? Um, the answer is um, with iGlimpse service. So iGlimpse service is an I dependency. Um, there is an implementation or I am working on an implementation of that that will be hopefully included in a future version of Orchard. Um, so I'm just going to demonstrate how this works. So Glimpse provides us with a timer and a message broker. Um, iGlimpse service wraps this up um, and provides helpful methods that hopefully um, it's just a single method call to instrument uh, your services. Um, it will time an action or a function. It can publish a message. But in most cases, what you want to do is you want to do both. You want to time your action. You want to time how long it took to render a widget. And then you want to publish that message to the broker. Um, there are certain circumstances where you don't want to do both at the same time. But more often than not, you will want to do both at the same time. So um, this is... Um, how a lot of you are probably thinking this would work. Um, so we can see we've created a Glimpse cache service. Um, it inherits from the default cache service, and it also suppresses the default cache service. Um, and we've put that in our Glimpse caching feature, which means that when we enable this Glimpse caching feature, um, the shell container factory will register this implementation as our cache service, as our iCache service. And that's all well and good. But the problem with that is that we've actually made quite a big assumption there. We've made the assumption that default cache service is the service that's in use. Yeah. So what if you've created a, a logged cache service or a logging cache service, and every cache call you want, you want to log? Um, well, your logged cache service would probably look similar to this, which means that you could only have your logged cache service or your Glimpse cache service in action at any one time. So um, there is actually a pattern that we can utilize to get around this issue. Uh, it's the decorator pattern. Um, out of the box with Orchard at the moment, it's relatively 
complex to do. There's no nice I dependency and it just works. Um, so introducing I decorator. Um, so this again is something um, that's not yet in Orchard Core. I'm hoping that it will be soon. Um, it's pretty vital to the way that the glimpse module works. So what does it look like? Um, so this is our glimpse cache service decorator. And we can see that we're not actually inheriting from the default cache service. What we're doing is we're saying this is a decorator of iCache service. And we're also injecting in iCache service into the constructor. Now, if you try to do this out of the box currently, um, without declaring it in iDecorator, you'll just get a circular dependency chain. So what this does is this allows you to stack implementations. So this Glimpse cache service doesn't care what your implementation of iCache service is. It will just take one and then delegate down. Um, so we can see what I've done here is I've decorated um, a single method, um, get object, which is a method on the iCache service. Um, this method takes a cache key, and it will return you um, an object if it's in the cache. So what we're doing is we're calling um, iGlimpseService.PublishTimedAction. So this will take an action or a function, execute that, um, time the results, and it will push a message to the message broker. Um, so this might look a bit complicated and nested, but it's quite powerful. There are, there are quite a lot of overrides on this method. You don't necessarily have to use this one. Um, I've just chose this one because it demonstrates quite a few of the, of the features you can do. So the first thing we're doing here is we're saying um, just called decorated service gets object of type T. So that is basically passing down to your decorated service. What implementation of that, it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we're just taking in whatever you've got registered. The next section, um, this builds our cache message. So this creates an instance of the cache message that we saw before. And we can see we're setting the properties there. So the action is a get. The duration is t.duration. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, we're also setting the key, whether or not there's a hit miss, and the value, which is r. So this message factory here actually accepts two um, arguments. One is the result of the action or function. Um, and t is the, the, the timer result. So that's where we're getting t.duration from and also value equals r. So in this instance, r is the cache result. It's the object that's returned from the cache, um, which is quite powerful, and I'll show you why later on. Um, the other three lines um, just help us um, format this message in the timeline. So we're saying it falls into the cache category for our um, the timeline. Um, the cache category is just a Poco object with three properties on. Um, I created that before. Um, you could just create a new instance of a of a of a cache ob of a timeline category there. But um, the next one is a factory that formats the subtext, um, and then the next one is what they call a, a subheading. And I'll, I'll show you what all those translate to in a second once you get to the demo. And then finally, you'll notice that this line returns dot action result. So glimp service dot publish timed action uh, returns an object called action result of type T. Um, and what we're saying is just return that. So that's just what your um, decorated service dot got get object returned. So we're actually just passing down to our decorated service and then returning that value back up. Um, so that's all the parts that we need to be able to publish messages in Glimpse. Uh, we've got our tab, we've got our message, and we've got our service that publishes the messages. So what does that look like? Um, it looks like this. Um, so we'll go to the cache service tab first. And we can see that we've got messages appearing in here. Um, 
We can see that I've put a value with the key of cash test and the value is zero. We can see we've then put again for a key called time test. Now this one has a, a, um, a time to live, it's got an expiry time. Um, it's also a bit of a more complex object, it's not just a simple type. And you can see that Glimpse is quite easily um, formatted this object, it knows how to display it. So we've got a string there, we've got a date time, um, and we've got an int there, and it, it, it's formatted it quite nicely. Um, we can also see how long these times have taken. Now that is because we our message implemented I duration message, um, and our Glimpse service has noticed that, and it will put the timing result there in for you. Um, um, you can also do a bit more nicer things, so you can see our cache misses, they're grayed out. Um, Glimpse out of the box provides you with some formatting um, you can utilize. Um, so we'll also see this in the timeline. Um, I'm going to have to zoom out to show you that, unfortunately. Um, so in the timeline, we now have our cache category. And that's a deeper shade of blue. And we can see here um, all those cache calls were made um, from within uh, Action Filter, which is why they're appearing there in the pipeline. Um, and we can see which cache key we got there. So we, we put time test, and it took 0 0.01 milliseconds, um, which is pretty powerful stuff, because five minutes ago, we didn't know how many cache calls we were making. We didn't know how many misses we were getting. We didn't know how long it was taking. Um, so the cache service is quite a simple example. Um, we can actually format and publish quite a lot of other messages. Um, so once we know how we can publish our cache service messages, we can go out and we can decorate quite a lot of things. Um, Okay. So um, this, uh, what we're seeing here is a branch that I've been working on um, that contains quite a lot of um, kind of instrumented features. Uh, we'll just go through them one by one. You can get an idea of the, of the data you can see, and you can get an idea of where the, where the slowdown in your apps is and where your apps might not be as performant as, as they possibly could be. Um, so the first tab is Authorizer. I'm actually logged in as the site owner, so everything will be um, resolved to true. Um, but you can see what permissions were evaluated, whether or not they evaluated to true, um, which content types those were for, um, this is quite useful for um, admin screens. So if you create an admin module and you have several different permissions, you can see possibly why this user can't see a certain tab um, and this user can. Um, it's quite a useful one to have. Uh, we've got a cache service tab um, that we saw before. Configuration is an out-of-the-box one. Um, quite an interesting one is Content Manager. Now, we actually found that the content manager was our biggest bugbear for performance. Um, once we got our sites up onto the box, the, cat, the content manager gets were anything between 15 and 40 milliseconds each. Um, which doesn't sound that bad, but then what you realize is that you're actually doing 20 to 30 of these per request. Um, obviously, if your page is output cached, you do fewer, but it, it's still quite an issue, so we were able to focus our efforts on reducing this time, um, and Glimpse allowed us to really, really know which areas we should spend our time on, um, which is quite powerful. So we can see um, each piece of content we've got, we can see the title for it, we can see if uh, we ask for a specific version, we've got the version options, um, so we can expand these and see a bit more information. Um, it's really cool stuff. Um, all these tabs give you a summary at the bottom um, of how many items and how long that took. So we can see we took 43 milliseconds in the content manager. Um, and before today, I bet very few people knew how long the content manager took. 
Um, so we've got a couple of other out-the-box tabs, configuration, environment, execution. Um, so we'll move straight on to the layers tab. Now, this is a really handy one for debugging why widgets might not be showing. Um, so we can see immediately here um, that um, three layers are resolved to true. We've got the authenticated layer because I'm logged in. We've got the home page because I'm on the home page. And we've got default, which is always true. Um, crucially, we can also see how long each layer took to evaluate. So we can see here that um, day of the week, Monday, um, which should be true, has taken a second to evaluate. Um, so something doesn't quite seem right there. Um, we can focus our efforts on fixing this issue, um, which we'll do in a second. Um, that tab shouldn't be there. Um, another really cool feature is that the SQL tab works. So remember, out the box, we had a SQL tab. Um, it wasn't being interest. Um, it wasn't being instrumented. Um, it is now, um, and this is really, really powerful stuff. So we can see we've opened 21 connections and we've made 21 queries. Um, the total query execution time and the total time that the connections were open. Um, the total time that connections were open seems quite high. I don't know if that's a bug with Glimpse or a bug with Orchard. Um, I'm sure someone here is probably better suited to say. Um, but crucially, we can also see what queries were executed in which parameters we have. Um, and if we scroll down, what we'll see is that we've got some pretty inefficient calls going on here. Um, so Glimpse will highlight queries that it thinks um, are inefficient or queries that appear to be ma being made more than once. And you might be able to add a join in, or in Hibernate might be able to add a join in and reduce the amount of queries that are being made here. So we can see this particular query here um, is selecting from content item version record, doing a couple of joins, and it's marked it as orange. So this means that. Um, Glimpse thinks that this query can be improved in one way or another. Um, but what I'll, yep. This is this is the default out the box SQL tab. Um, I had to add in a. Um, I, can't, I can't remember what I changed, but I did change something to get um, it to work with Orchard. You look confused. No. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so um, if we keep going as well, what we'll see is um, a lot of very similar queries here. Um, so what we're doing here is we're selecting layers. We're actually selecting all the layers that are in the site um, one by one, which doesn't seem right. Um, so we should probably fix that, but we'll do that later. Um, the Shapes tab um, replaces the Views tab that we had out of the box um, from Glimpse. So the Shapes tab, um, it tells us what shapes were uh, rendered. It tells us how long they took to render. It tells us if there was um, any available alternates. It tells us wrappers. It tells us where it found the shape from, which is really cool stuff. Um, I'll just scroll along so we should be able to see a nice uh, so we've got a list of alternates there, and we've also got build duration on the right-hand side. Um, I'm going to have to zoom out just to, because I can't get to the tabs on the right-hand side when I'm zoomed this far in, unfortunately. Um, we have a trace tab, which comes out of the box with glimpse. Um, if you ever have any trace statements, they'll appear there. I can't stress how useful I've found that in debugging um, features that we have written. Um, once we get them deployed, it's quite nice to know what's going on. We can see instantly what's going on in there. And the final tab that we have, um, you can't quite see it, but it says widgets. So let's have a look in there. Um, so this is telling me that we've got two widgets rendered. We've got a widget called main menu, and we've got a widget called HTML widget test. Um, so this is the menu, obviously, and this is the HTML test widget. We can see which layer they're in. We can see the layer rule, we can see the zone, we can see the permit, uh, position. Um, and we, crucially, we can also see how long each widget took to um, build a display. So we know that our menu, uh, menu widget in this instance took 68 milliseconds to build display. 
So for those who don't know, build display is effectively how long each of your drivers take. Um, so every part that you've got is kind of the cul culmination of that. Um, so that's pretty powerful stuff. And again, that allowed us to really fine tune each of our widgets. So this is a very basic example, but our sites, um, some of our sites have 60, 70, 80 layer rules. Um, so that SQL bug that I demonstrated, that kind of comes to force then. We also have a lot of custom layer rules, so we were able to, to determine which ones were slow. We also have a lot of custom widgets, and we were able to determine which parts were the offending parts, which ones we should kind of focus our efforts on. Um, so what we've done there is we've just extended Glimpse with Orchard tabs, but the beauty of this is you can actually extend Glimpse with your own tabs. So um, this is something that we've done. Um, so this is two screenshots from one of our sites. Um, you can see our trace tab um, is telling us why our auth service thought you were authenticated. So in this instance, I'm logged in as the site owner. So you can see, I don't know if you can read that very well, but it says ID auth authenticated user is the site owner. Um, you can put whatever you want in there. Um, we do, and it's extremely useful. Um, you can also install tabs from the Glimpse gallery. So I installed the log for net tab. Um, and with very minimal configuration, I basically had to change logfinet.config, and I got it to log to the Glimpse output. So you can see any log messages that were raised during this request um, in this log for net tab. Um, something else we've done is we've wrote our own tab called external requests. Um, this wraps our API clients, and it tells us not only how long each request took, but also what the payload was. And if it was a post request, what was sent out. Um, insanely useful to diagnose. Um, traditionally, um, my team's been the top of the stack. So we have 15, 20 components written by other teams, and it kind of all comes together on the CMS. Something breaks on one of those 15 downstream components where the first port of call. Now we can say, ah, it's because the profile service is returned to 500 for whatever reason. So we can see here, we've made an API call to a URL. Um, this instance, it's to get a, a token to allow me to play a slot game. Um, we can see the payload as well. We can see the user ID and the game token that was returned. Um, if that failed, we'd also see any, um, any failure messages, any faults, uh, and also the status code, um, which is extremely useful. Um, OK, so. Switching back to the demo. Um, I did have all the demos embedded in PowerPoint, which is, but then I can't zoom in, unfortunately, which is why I'm switching between. Um, OK, so let's just go back to the widget tab, because I want to show you quite a cool feature um, that's in here right now. So. Um, we can see that our uh, menu widget um, is taking 68 milliseconds to render. Um, I don't know if any one of you can hazard a guess at why, but I'd like to hazard a guess it's because we're using content item links. Um, so what we can actually do is we can just click this edit link, and it will take us um, to the edit screen in the admin panel for that specific widget. Um, and I very helpfully created a different menu with the same links in, but they're now just simple links. And we'll save that. And we've gone from 68 milliseconds to 46, just by changing the type of menu items that are within that menu. So the menu itself appears exactly the same, it behaves exactly the same. Um, but these are the kind of optimizations that you can flush out once you know exactly what your site is doing. Um, you can also click to edit your HTML widgets. Um, if, you're not quite, if you don't quite like the text, if there's a typo, you can just click Edit. It'll take you to the Edit page. You click Save. It'll bring you back. You can see the change there and then. Um, 
But let's go back to what we noticed before with the layers. So, um, can anyone remember, was it 21 queries in total before? So let's fix that. Um, okay, so um, when I saw that, I actually had a look to try and figure out, and I swear I haven't planted this, this was here when I got here. Um, so this is the bit of code that's responsible for effectively fetching the layers immediately before they're evaluated by the layer evaluation service. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to the content manager and we're saying, get me um, the layer parts for type layer, and then we're iterating them further down. Um, so we're doing active layer dot record dot layer rule. So what's happened here is we've ended up with a M plus one issue where the first kind of chunk of code here, this chunk at the top, is saying get me all the layers, and then this here is saying now iterate those layers and go and get the rest of the data for that, for that layer record. Sebastian does not look happy. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to fix this, and I just want to highlight, um, once you actually know what's going wrong in your app, I want to highlight how easy it is to fix the problems because this is a one-line fix. And that's it there. So we're basically saying expand the layer parts. One, two. Can someone create a pull request while he's working, writing it? Well, you've spoiled the surprise now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've just, we've just added that in, and I'll just go and demo the difference that makes. Um, so what did we have up before? 21 queries? Um, I've also fixed our layer issue as a thread dot sleep. Um, so um, we can see now if we go to our layers. Uh, I'm keeping you in suspense. So our slowest layer now is 0 0.15 milliseconds. Uh, he knew if you remove a thread dot sleep 1000, it would make it go quicker. Um, but we'll let's have a look at the SQL tab. Um, so we can see we're now down to 12 queries from 21. Um, so I had eight layers, and it's removed eight database queries from that. Nine queries. Nine layers. Um, so you can actually see this in the timeline as well. Um, I, before I show you this, I'm going to caveat it with um, it's showing yellow lines for active connections. I don't know if that's a bug in Orchard or a bug with something that I've done um, just yet. Um, but I'll show you it anyway. Um, QIST. Let's zoom out a bit. OK, so each of these big yellow lines is an open database connection. It appears to open them when it needs them. So you can see it's opened one here and then used it pretty much straight away. The command executed relatively quickly and it doesn't appear to have closed it until there. Um, but what we'll see if we scroll down now is... Uh, what database are you using here? Oh, this is just local SQL CA. Yeah, it's all just a bog standard, press the button, default recipe setup. Um, so we can see down here, um, so this is our layer evaluations here. We now only have one query to get the layers. And then we can see how long each one took to evaluate. Um, what I'll do is I'll just compare that with a previous one that had this SQL bug. Uh, not that one. Timeline. Um, so here we are. So you can see what's happening here is it's only in connection. It's making a single query to get that layer, evaluating it, and then moving on to the next one. So we've removed all those database connections and calls. Um, so Sebastian suggested that somebody created a pull request. A question on the connection opened. What version of Orchard are you using? Which version? Uh, that's dev. I checked. Before. I, I did check that. Um, oh, I clicked it and it went away. Okay, so it's not letting us click that. I should have tested this. 
Um, I'll create the pull request when I get back to my seat, I promise. Okay. <laughs> In? Okay. I don't know how to refresh. Okay, so that's in. Um, so, um, I'm going to be honest, I didn't rehearse this, so I had no idea how long this would last, so I've got a little bit extra as well to show you, because I didn't think we'd get this far. Actually, before we do that, has anyone got any questions? <laughs> a short question about those decorators. Um, uh, how you implemented the um, control of the ordering of the decorators? Um, <laughs> good or is question. It, is there is no order. Um, no, it follows. The, it currently, it follows the same order um, as you would expect when you register your ID dependencies. So it, it, it's it's based on um, featured dependencies um, and how you declare dependencies in your manifest files. Um, when I originally designed this decorator, I actually started with a an, an attribute. So similar to the orchard feature attributes, it was an orchard decorator attribute, and you could pass a string as a flat position compare to kind of dictate where you wanted to go, because you may, I don't know, you may want your glimpse stuff to wrap everything else, but you don't want everything else to be dependent on glimpse. Um, I haven't implemented that at the moment, because I got it working, and then I think Sebastian suggested I change the way I did it. Um, which is why we've got the i dependent, uh, sorry, i decorator interface now of type, mm -hmm. whatever you're decorating. Um, <laughs> so that's the answer. At the okay, moment. Thank you. Two minutes. Okay. Do you use it on your production site or yes. only on dev? Yes, we use it on a production site. Um, Glimpse has. Um, an interface called iGlimpse Security Policy you can implement and you can create your own access um, rules. Out of the box it ships with it will only work on local hosts and um, there's actually a button you've got to click to enable Glimpse. You've got to go to slash glimpse.exd and click a button to enable it. I actually, for the sake of this demo, I disabled that. Um, but we wrote one that only allows, on our production sites, only allows access from um, a whitelisted set of IPs. We've also transformed out some tabs just in case, so you can't see the configuration tab on production, just in case something slips through the net and someone opened it. Just got one more question. Uh, does it work also offline mode, like uh, analyzing production for half an hour, send all this save data to developers? Um, okay, so this is a perfect opportunity to show the little bit extra I was going to show. Um, <laughs> glimpse out the box, stores all the data it collects in memory um, and for certain requests. Um, the current version will only save the past 25 requests. Um, the next version allows you to configure how many. But because it's extensible, you can actually switch out your storage provider. Um, so I created a New Relic Insights storage provider. So I don't know if anyone uses New Relic Insights. You may or may not have heard of New Relic um, New Relic Insights is a really cool tool. It, similar to Glimpse, it allows you to push messages up, but allows you to query them on an aggregate basis. Um, so, very, very quickly, because I think I'm being rushed for time. Um, this is our production data um, for widget execution. So this is basically the data that get pushed into the widget tab. Uh, and New Relic Insights here is listing it. Um, but New Relic Insights is really cool if anyone's used it because you can query it and it'll give you nice charts. 
Um, so we can actually see here aggregate data, um, build duration for widgets, most time consuming widgets, most rendered widget types. Um, and that's over a period of, I don't know, it's got a funny retention policy in your look inside, so I honestly don't know how long that is. Um, but you can, it, it's since one week ago, uh, so it's limited to one week, but um, the amount of messages that we push, they probably flush them out before that. Um, you basically pay on how many messages it stores. Um, so we've got some quite cool data here. We can see our payments widget, um, possibly understandably, is the slowest of all. Uh, menu widget, most time consuming, because we have quite a lot of menu widgets on each page, three, four, and it's a relatively slow widget. Uh, we can also see which layers least often resolve to true. So we now know how long each layer takes to evaluate, and we know that the layers are evaluated all the time. So why have a layer that always resolves to false? It's, it's a waste of time. So we can see that all these least resolved layers here, um, each of these are layer names, and um, none of those are ever resolved to true, um, which kind of means that our content editors shouldn't have put them on in the first place. Um, very quickly, uh, we've also got content manager data in there, um, and we also have cache, so we know how often our cache hits, misses, um, cache events, and our most missed, our most missed cache keys, um, which tells us that um, maybe something's wrong, maybe we're not putting there, as often as we should do, maybe they don't last for as long as they should. Um, this doesn't come out of the box of torture, unfortunately. I wrote something to do this, but it's just more to demonstrate that it is possible to do. You can switch out the storage provider quite easily. Um, I think that might be it. Thank you. Yeah.